Today's podcast episode is sponsored by Biogenetics. Biogenetics, nutrition uncompromised. I personally do contract educational events for Biogenetics and have been able to see this organization firsthand. The fine folks over at Biogenetics are committed to putting the best training, the best nutrients, backed by the best science in your hands, helping you to change the face of healthcare in your community. Biogenetics has an offer for you today, a really great offer. It's a way for you to experience the biogenetics difference for only the cost of shipping. Biogenetics will send you the product of the month for free. Yes, for free. Just cover the cost of shipping. Follow the link in the podcast notes below and handle the rest on their web platform. Again, that's a free bottle of the product of the month at no cost to you, sans shipping. Experience the biogenetics difference today. Biogenetics, nutrition, uncompromised. Welcome to the Nutrition Hero Podcast with Dr. Brad Watts, making heroes in functional medicine and clinical nutrition. Now, here's Dr. Watts. Today, I have a special guest for you on Nutrition Hero Podcast, somebody that I'm excited for you to hear, uh, not just his heart, but also his strategy, the way that he goes about building his life, customizing or custom engineering his life to better serve his community, and better serve functional medicine community as a whole. Today's guest is Dr. Brandon Crater, and Dr. Crater is a doctor of chiropractic out of Denver, Colorado. And we get into a lot of interesting topics with him today, but I want to make sure that you pay attention to, uh, one, the passion and how you relate passion into progress, or how you engineer your lifestyle to better serve your community. Without any further ado, let's get to the podcast episode with Dr. Brandon Crater. All right, Nutrition Hero family, this is what I have been talking about. This interview that is coming up here today is something that I know you are going to enjoy. And um, ask me how I know, because way back in the day, I started my functional medicine career, my clinical nutrition career, Working in a practice in Denver, Colorado, and one of the principal owners of the clinic was your guest today, Dr. Brandon Crater. Dr. Crater, are you there, sir? I am, Brad. How are you? I'm doing well. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the Nutrition Hero family today. And I'm excited. I just got to tell you, I'm excited about our conversation, see where it takes us. Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting. Yes. And... Um, a couple of things that I want to get into right off the bat is I would like to discuss some of the current projects you have moving in the functional medicine world. You are, as you uh, can guess it from the introduction here, a mover and shaker in the industry. What's going on? What's life like right now? What's the pulse of functional medicine like? Well, uh, uh, life is pretty busy. Um I think, as you're aware, we we still uh, run and own two clinics, functional medicine clinics. They are they are 100% uh, functional medicine exclusive uh, clinics, one in Denver and one in Seattle. And uh, we also um, are, are rebranding and relaunching our consulting and coaching space, uh, coaching program in the functional medicine space, and um, as well uh, trying to grow and run uh, the bi Biogenetics, the uh, nutrition company, and then starting a fifth company, <laughs> wow. believe it or not. Yeah. Um, Heather and I are, are always trying to uh, expand, and uh, our, our motto, our BHAG, if you, if you will, our big goal is to change the face of healthcare, and we're looking to start our own brand um, and go direct to consumer with some of our information and, and, and really push our, our passion out there more and more. And we just got a new puppy, so we're busy. <laughs> <laughs> you, it sounds like you need more to do. <laughs> so, yeah. all right. Very cool. So one of the things that I appreciate about you and Heather, and Heather, by the way, for those of you listening, if you're not familiar, Dr. Heather Crater is Dr. Brandon Crater's wife. They tag team almost all of their operations together. And um, so good working relationship there, I would imagine, as well. Right, Dr.? <laughs> yeah, I mean, ever since we went to school together and uh, graduated together, and and she was the one that really got me into functional medicine. Uh, interestingly enough, uh -huh. and um, 
ever ever since then we we've done everything together not only in our personal space kids family the whole thing of course but everything we do in business is together um and it's been uh it's been cool um for, for a lot of people they think um that it, it would present challenges and it really it really has not other than the the normal business challenges that you have have and sometimes personality clashes and what have you but it's always worked well for us because we have the same vision we have the same goals um so it's easy to work work in the same space together yeah that's that's actually a pretty big deal one like how many people can work with any business partner effectively in the long run but then number two spend most of your day together that's impressive because of what you just mentioned right there your same goals the same vision let's right. talk about the vision for functional medicine right now. Um, one of the things that we like to do on Nutrition Hero Podcast is we like to organize not just where functional medicine has been, but where is it going? Where is What's the next step in the industry? How are we going to serve patients differently than we are today? And not necessarily, um, you know, 10 years down the road, but like next week, three weeks from now. What do you feel yeah. like right now when you have a vision for functional medicine? What are you looking at as the future of the industry? Boy, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think what happens is you get so used to working in the day to day and keeping up with things and working in your businesses and uh, trying to scratch time to work on your businesses. businesses um, that's sure. Sure, you, we often think about the industry and the space as a whole um, and how we can impact it, you know, where we see it going. Um, I think for me, I think the biggest thing is the functional medicine industry or space, I think it has to grow in order to be more and more impactful. I mean, when you look at its impact relative to the entire healthcare um, space, it's, it's still pretty small. Mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly growing, um, but if you're in functional medicine uh, uh, and you listen to podcasts like this and you listen, you, you know, you follow other leaders and movers and shakers in the industry and, and you're, you're immersed in it, you tend to think that it's larger than it actually is. Right. And I mean, obviously that's really, if you take a step back, that's really not the case. So I think one of the things that has to happen and where I, where I see it uh, in the future and, and what we're trying to impact, we're trying to grow it. We're trying to uh, push it forward and, and have more and more practitioners embracing this clinical model, um, you know, anywhere from chiropractors to medical doctors, osteopathic physicians, nutritionists, life coaches, health coaches, et cetera, et cetera, because the more and more people that are out there, um, exposing the public to this clinical paradigm uh, the better off we're going to be the better off our communities are going to be in the end and the more impact we're going to have in the healthcare space so i think that's probably the main thing for me i, I just think it, it has to get bigger it has to continue to spread uh -huh. um, to, to the masses so do you think um because i 100 percent agree with you on that <laughs> do you think that functional medicine or clinical nutrition as a whole is going to organize and mimic medicine where practices just get larger and larger? Or do you think it's still going to be able to be a single doctor practice or a single nutritionist clinic, that type of thing in the future? Like, do you think it's going to be sustainable um, in the current model that it is? You know, I, I don't think so. I don't think you can grow that way. I think in order to reach the masses, I think it has to you have to have some type of uh, some level of organization for it to be um, accepted, if you will, and part yeah. of mainstream. I right. guess you know, I see it moving into a place where the average family, when they have when they're thinking about their health or think about the health of their kids or they're having a health challenge or problem, their immediate first thought is not to go to a, a traditional doctor in the drug therapy model and find this, you know, a pseudo solution there, but rather thinking, oh, I'm going to go find, I need to go find a functional medicine doctor, or better yet, I have this issue, challenge, or question, and I'm going to go talk to my functional health practitioner first. Right. Um, right. I think in order for that to occur, you're going to have to have some level of organization. Okay. Um, I think it's probably always going to be a hybrid, but you know, I could see it maybe being in the future 75% 
sort of big, not big, big business, but more organized. Right. Um, and maybe 25% where you still have amazing practitioners, brilliant people still working in a single doctor, so, sort of single clinic, smaller clinic model. Right. So if we can expand that a little bit, because I, working in one of your practices back in the day here, uh, fresh out of school, I had some experience that, I mean, it was second to none from a clinical perspective, but then also get to peek behind the curtain a little bit and experience what is it like to run a successful functional medicine clinic? What is it like to be in a space where you have more than one doctor? Can, do you want to, can you touch on that at all? Like, um, I know, man, this was a bunch of years ago now and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I want to say that the practice was doing between six and $7 million a year, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it, it grew to a seven and a half million dollar oh, cash dude. practice. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it was very large. Um, it was very busy. Um, there was a lot of moving pieces. And, you know, I, that was important for us at the time. Uh -huh. And I think it kind of goes back to your question about where do you see the future of functional medicine? I think what practitioners fail to, to recognize or fully embrace, because I, most of the practitioners I've talked to over the years, and it's been a lot, and uh, certainly all of the ones I've coached and consulted with over the years, at some they they all have to some degree or another like this major purpose, right? Their passion and their purpose, right, to help their fellow man, to work in their communities, to help people with healthcare challenges. For for the majority of people, is real. It it is a legitimate. Um, authentic passion and purpose and so they they, they always lead with, with that and right. um it, again it's real to them and they want to heal the world so to speak but our ability as practitioners um to do that is limited by or can only be as big as our clinics are in, in other words if we're not good or proficient on the business side then we're not going to be able to realize our goals, our you know our purpose-driven goals as far as helping people. So that was always important to us. We we had this as we began to learn about functional medicine and learn about all the mechanisms and the physiology and really learn the practical applications of that. We're like, more and more people need to know this. I mean, right? We would just get so frustrated and almost angry when we would. Uh, have low months and we weren't we didn't have enough people moving to the moving through the clinics because we know and knew at that time there's so many people suffering and they just didn't know about functional medicine right so like in that space though is that uh, one of the things I appreciate I guess is that your dreams didn't stop at well let's just have a huge clinic and serve our community let's teach no. like I appreciate that your dreams were like let's not just serve the community, let's serve the country, and ultimately let's serve the the world That's by right. teaching other providers not just the mechanistic approach, but like how to keep your lights on, how to keep your door open, that type of thing. Right. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean it, that was important for us because you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, I just touched on it. Our big, our BHAG, our big hairy audacious goal, and it took us a while. You know, our business coach a long time ago sort of forced us to develop our BHAG. Right. And it took a while and it was frustrating. It took months and months and months to come up with it. And every time we bring something to us, you're like, yeah, that's interesting, but that's not it. I'm like, right. yes, that's it. That's my passion. Yeah. Um, but it, it, so it, it, it took a while to refine it. And, that, and your BHAG is something that you really, it should be big enough that you're probably never ever going to achieve it. It's something right. you always continue to reach for. Right. And that for us was changing the face of healthcare. We looked at the healthcare model and we know it's broken and right. it pisses us off and it makes us angry and it, it, it pushes us to want to offer something better. And at the, at the time that we were growing our clinic, you know, you start to feel the pressure of all of that energy and managing all of that staff. And you get to a point, and then we had kids, we had young kids, and it, at, at some point we looked up and the kid, the nanny was raising our kids. Yeah. And in other words, there's only so much you can do as an individual. 
So if you have something great, if you develop something great and your, your mission is to change the face of healthcare, you ultimately have to work to enlist others and train others and reach out to others that can go out and reach their maximum amount of patients, right? So that way you can right. have an exponential impact on, on the world. Right. So that's, that's really what pushed us in that direction. I mean, we, we built a great clinical model um, and really refined it and distilled it so that it could be applicable to most people so that they could actually have it and, and take it off in bite-sized chunks and be right. successful. I right. think a lot of clinicians tend to um, do too much too fast. So we really refined that, but along the way, we developed an amazing business model that, that sort of married really nicely with the clinical model. And that's what we were able to go out and, and, and teach people and just an extension of ourselves for the greater purpose right. of changing the face of healthcare. So uh, I would imagine that in a coaching setting, you're going to find people that do very well learning a clinical model and a business model. And you have people that maybe they don't do so well in learning that. Um, and there's obviously there's some personal characteristics that you and Dr. Heather would have that allow you to be successful in that model. What yeah. uh, is there? Is there a way of approaching um, business? Is there a way of approaching maybe maybe we call it personal development or maybe like a lifestyle that you live? And maybe that's a huge question, but <laughs> is there a yeah. way that moves you towards the successful replication of a functional medicine clinic? What does that look like? Boy, that's interesting. I, that's, that is a loaded question because there are so many different elements to being successful. Um, I think probably the, the, the most important thing for us was having a clear understanding of what we were all about, what our passion was and what our purpose was. Mm -hmm. And again, developing that BHAG, that, that is our foundation. So everything that we do, and I think this is important for everyone listening, if you can, if you can really be in touch with what it is that you're all about and what type of change that you're trying to affect in the world for the better, um, that's always your springboard to doing the next thing. So in other words, if my, if my stated goal is to change the face of healthcare, it's very difficult for me to sit on the couch and waste time, you know, right. Watching TV or surfing right. Facebook or whatever. I, I, I just, I feel guilty. It doesn't mean that I don't do those things. That doesn't mean I don't watch a movie or get into, you know, a certain TV series or something like that. That it just means that I'm aware of how I spend my time because how I spend my time, which is limited, right? right? There's there's a finite amount of time that I have on this earth to impact the world and it's not renewable. I mean, my time in this body is, is a non-renewable resource. So I have to do what I can to maximize that time. Uh, falling back on that purpose and that and that passion was always important for us. And I, and I found as I look at other clients and other colleagues that do very well, that's always a, an important theme. Because at the end of the day, when you are trying to do something, it ultimately comes down to implementation. Right. That's and yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. So you, you, you can learn. I mean, we're always trying to learn, whether it's clinical, business, marketing, sales, self-development, spiritual development. You, you should always be trying to learn. So I listen to a lot of pod, podcasts and they're very help, helpful to me. I, I read a lot of books. Mm -hmm. uh, I talk to a lot of people, talk to a lot of successful people and you get nuggets, right? Right. And, right. but those that information is only going to be able to impact your life and those of others and your business, et cetera, if you implement the things that you learn. Exactly. And yeah, right. And implementation is, is difficult because we live in a busy world. But if your purpose is sound and you know what you're going for, you always have that to kind of motivate you and, and implement. So I think that's maybe the two things that I, I, I try, try to focus on and teach my clients and others. Look, what's your purpose? Why are you doing this? And it can't just be about the money. Right. It, 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 just, it can't be. Not, yeah, right. That's got to be more than that. It's. 
that can be a very important part of it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if your purpose is just to make money in this area in healthcare, I think you're always going to have a challenge. So there's this stat out there right now um, in the research that talks about only three to five percent of people can go to a seminar or listen to a podcast and actually implement three to five percent. That's like that's not very big. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, I think one of the reasons why is exactly what you just touched on is that I like people don't know what their purpose is, so they don't know where to implement because they're taking in information that doesn't align with what they're here for. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, what's interesting is I think everyone has a purpose. And I, I talked to a lot of people and I've coached a lot of people over the years and, and people, they'll, they'll communicate with me. Like, I don't really know what my purpose is. I don't think I have one. Sure. But I think, I think, Everyone has a purpose and it's, it's that thing deep down inside that, that kind of scares you, that you feel that you might feel like if you led with your purpose and you said what you really felt and you went out into the world and message to, you know, your market or, or whatever the case may be with how you really felt, mm-hmm. you might feel like it's hokey or it's trite or it's maybe you feel like it's too big right. or too, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like too idealistic, right. you know, you, you might listen to other people or get into a negative space and feel like it's not reachable. I think for most people, if they just, if they get quiet and quiet their minds and listen to what's really meaningful to them and then have the courage to push it out, you'll find your passion there. Exactly. I like, I can't agree with you more because when you look, even from a perspective of helping patients, if you look at the patients that are successful in a functional medicine model, the people mm-hmm. that can follow directions, the people that can implement the care plan with you are the ones that understand what they're there for. Like it's something yeah. specific and clear. Right. So very cool. One of the things you mentioned is um, this, this uh, self-development or spiritual development uh, and I'm sure you can touch on kind of your journey in that space, but um, I feel like as a functional medicine provider and being able to talk with doctors all over the country on a daily basis, one of the things that I find is is that people either don't want to talk about it or when they do talk about that kind of stuff, um, it's never in um, like it's so esoteric that people can't really grab onto it. Do you know what I'm saying? I know exactly what you're saying, and here's my my comment on that or my feedback. Yeah. For all the practitioners listen, listening, no matter what type of practitioner you are, from a nutritionist to a chiropractor to uh, a naturopathic doctor, whatever, a health coach, the folks that come to see you that are interested or potentially interested in what you do, they are not going to pay for your services based upon your knowledge based upon how many mechanisms you know, based upon how many you know, biochemical pathways you have memorized and how, how well you can write them out and you know all the cofactors from step A to step B, <laughs> they, they don't care about that. Right. Now, that's a, that's, it's, a, it's important, right? You have to have that. It, it's, it's a small piece of the puzzle, but only a small piece. What they really come to you for is leadership. And I think a lot of practitioners miss that piece. They, they don't quite understand what they're selling, if you will, what they're offering. You're not offering health care. You're not even offering hope. What people are looking for is they're looking for leadership. So the, the reason why that's important is when you, when you talk about personal development, spiritual development, emotional intelligence, um, are you doing and leading a lifestyle that is... Um, sort of um, incongruence with kind of what you teach in your practice, all of those things is what they're looking for. They're looking for it visibly. Now, this does not mean you have to be magazine cover ready, right? We're not talking about that. Do you, do you embrace the lifestyle? Right. And 
are you working on yourself as an individual so that the, when, when people meet you and they see you and they are in your space and they're in your energy, they can experience how you vibrate. That, that's, that's super unique, for. the way that you said that. That is, I agree. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. So, because what happens is, is people learn uh, ways of talking to patients. They learn ways of communicating what it is they've been studying their whole life. But it right. comes across as a politician rather than um, somebody that is like full of substance. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, that's where the value is. That's, you know, think about it. I mean, people just think about the, the, the mock up, the situation. You're a healthcare provider and patients who are usually sick. Many of them are chronically ill. Many of them have been so many different places to been so many different clinics different quote unquote specialists and now they finally come to you a functional health or functional medicine provider clinical nutritionist you know what are what are they really looking for they're looking for someone to grab them by the hand and take them out of a very dark place show them the way and if you can if you can develop yourself to a degree where where that is palpable yeah, that that's pretty much the whole game, right? And they kind of assume that you know what you're talking about, right. and, <laughs> and 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 when you communicate with them, yes, you're going to give them dashes of clinical excellence. You're going to wow them, wow them with impressive words and talking about why this is happening, why that that is happening. But more than anything, they're they're looking at you to get direct information about whether or not you're a leader and also indirect information. In other words, what are you all about? What is the essence of you? How do you vibrate? That stuff's super important. That's, and um, one of the things I appreciate is you talk about development or unpacking. One of the things that I firmly believe is that people can only live out what they've already lived in, so to speak, or they've lived internally already. Yeah. So you had mentioned something yeah. about meditating earlier. Is that a practice that you utilize? Um, I'll answer that question. But let, let me go back. You just said something that that reminded me of something, and and I say it this way. Sure. I, you know, in in business, I've learned to, and it took me a while to get here. I learned to embrace the the term selling. A lot of people shy away from that, but I learned, I, I, I've, it, it took me a while to get it. You know, I was broke for a long time. I was failing in practice for a long time. I was not reaching my goals for a long time. And therefore I, I wasn't impacting people the way I wanted to impact people. And I was letting down my family, my business, my community, et cetera, et cetera. And I finally had to come to terms with, look, in order to treat the people, you have to first be able to sell them. And it's not like I'm selling crack or selling heroin. I'm selling something amazing, right? I'm right. saving, I'm ultimately saving lives. So I had to get over that. Um, and that was an important aspect to me. And, and all that to say this, you can't sell what you don't have. Mm. Think of it. Let's think of it. Let's think, of, think, of, think of you as a business owner and you sold, I don't make it, a widget. You sold I don't know, iPhones, and someone came to your store to buy an iPhone, and you said, yeah, I sell iPhones. You're like, well, I'd like to buy one. Well, we don't have any. Right. You physically cannot sell what you don't have. Now, take that concept into um, the realm of selling healthcare. If you don't currently own health, totally. you have nothing to sell. Right. Right? Right. Right. So just a different way of saying what you said. Uh, yeah. Now I forgot your question. It was a good question. <laughs> so one of the one of the things that I appreciate. Oh. Go ahead. You asked me a question about meditation. Yeah. So like one of the things I appreciate is that you're open enough to talk about your practices, like your daily practices, your habits, what you do in order to continue not just to maintain but to grow yourself, um, 
think of it as like filling out who you are and you get the rest of your life in order to do that. And some people go very slowly at it, right? Some people regress and some people progress. And so that's what I appreciate. You had mentioned something about uh, meditation. Is that a practice that you uh, participate in? Is that something that you recommend people do in order to build uh, into themselves? Hmm. That's an interesting question. And it's interesting because, you know, when I listen to other podcasts, um, you know, one of the things that is so cool with most of them I listen to is the people that are being interviewed and the interviewer. They're always, it always seems to me that they are just so open, right, with right. their life. And it's just, it's raw. And I, and I love that. And um, this question kind of pushes me to expose the truth about myself. <laughs> you <laughs> so thank you for that. And I'm, I'm, I'm being pushed to be super authentic here. Um, so let me, let me talk about the, the way things are right now with respect to that concept of meditation sure. in, in, in present time. And right now it's in present time, it's been a struggle. Um, I have not meditated consistently uh, and the way that I know how for quite a while. And I will tell you that because of that, um, my results are not where I want them to be. To a large extent, um, I have been suffering. And, uh, and I think that's really the right word. I, I've been suffering with happiness, with motivation, with expansion with, again, the results that I have currently in my life because of my unwillingness to right. do the work of self-development meditation. And I am, boy, I am right on the edge. I am super close to getting back into that and get, getting back into it in a big way. And ultimately, that's how Heather and I built our business. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, we learned a lot of skills. Yes, we took a lot of seminars and nerded out on all the functional medicine stuff and became very proficient clinicians um, and did the same with business stuff. But I'll tell you the thing, the, the, the way that we built our business was through meditation, spiritual, emotional, mental development. And that's the truth of the matter. Um, it wasn't until we really focused on those aspects of, of who we are as people, as spiritual beings, that we were able to grow to a seven and a half million dollar practice. Right. Um, yeah. So it was, a, it, was it, it was a huge part of our success. Um, and what's what's interesting is along the way, we learned a, a bunch of amazing skills. We refined our skill set. Our toolbox is pretty full. And now that I'm not on that path of paying attention to the meditation aspect, I can survive and I have a great life just deploying those tools that I learned. Right. But again, change, changing the face of healthcare and, and, and moving that forward will not take another step until I get back to the meditation, the spiritual development and getting that, getting myself centered again. Well, you have to get on. I'll send you a bill here shortly. Okay. You're going to have to get back on that. <laughs> and, and look, I've, I've had some amazing uh, along those lines. I've had some <laughs> teachers yeah. and mentors in that space that have uh, really given me a, a lot of great tools there that I'm getting ready to get back into and, 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 and work with them a little bit more intimately. So here, here's the reason why I ask and the reason why we developed that question a little bit as we're just dialoguing here, is that um, I find that a lot of people, for whatever reason, it could be like a religious connotation or whatever, a lot of people that are in a space of, here's where I am, I don't want to stay there, I want to move to the next level, whatever that is in their mind, they are not oftentimes willing to implement a strategy or do what they're supposed to, even if you don't want to call it meditation, if you, even if you want to call it a um, you know, just time with myself or whatever it is. I yeah. feel like people are sometimes afraid to do that because they think they deserve where they currently are. Does that make sense? 
Yes. <laughs> and and with that in mind, it's um, sometimes I feel like as a functional medicine provider, if you're frustrated with clinical practice or if you're frustrated with your own health, whatever it is, sometimes people are unwilling to do what they know they should because they feel like, nope, this is, I, I think I should suffer a little bit more. Like I need to suffer here a little bit longer. And, and it, like, maybe they're not suffering. Maybe life is awesome. But um, I think that's a, a subject that we could probably talk for hours on that by itself. Don't you think? <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. I think so. <laughs> it's a quandary. Um, yeah, it is. So, I, um, yeah, it's a, you know, what comes up for me when you say that, it, it sounded to me like you're saying there are people, and I think every person to whatever extent, and yes. I'm almost certain of this, that they, they, they find themselves bumping their head against the ceiling of expansion. And a, lo a lot of times, and the inability to break through is, is self-sabotage. It's right. whatever, and, and, and that can come in many forms. Right. Um, even, even the billionaires have, have this, issue right everybody's to one degree or another trying to, to trying to expand i think one of the easiest ways i found to get out of that and get out of my own way is to make my life and what i'm doing more than just about myself more than just about my kids and my family and and, and making it bigger um that that's helped me tremendously that's and like, thank you for being so open with that because that's reality because who suffers from that complex situation right there more than anybody, your patients that have chronic disease, right? That's right. Almost. I mean, I don't think you're going to meet anybody with chronic disease that is not dealing with that in some form or fashion. Otherwise they wouldn't need your help really. Right. And, so. and, and, and otherwise they wouldn't be suffering with chronic disease. If you really yeah. think about it. If they weren't de dealing with, you know, many levels of self-sabotage and this, you know, background um, communication with themselves that they need to suffer, that they're not good enough, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. If they didn't have that, they probably wouldn't be chronically ill. So in order for us to reach people where they are, we, we have to be doing this work ourselves to, to, to one degree or another. Doesn't mean you're going to become a monk. You know, it doesn't sure. mean you're going to be perfect, it, but it does mean that you're taking steps uh, towards your expansion. And that's, again, that's part of, you know, being able to sell what you have. You can't sell what you don't have. It's part of that, that personal expansion is leadership. Very cool. So I can't, I can't tell you how many times over the years, sorry to interrupt, yeah. that, and it's happened so many times that it's almost embarrassing when it happens. And it's almost embarrassing for me to tell you guys <laughs> that when we were in active practice and working on the, the admission side, or if you want to call it the sales side, when a patient or prospective patient at the time would tell us, I just want to be like you. Right. You right. know, and it's, it's just, it's interesting because that's what they're looking at. And if, if there are several people verbalizing that to you think about how many people are are thinking that feeling that that won't say that to you mm -hmm. it, it's a lot of them so you got to be careful what you present to people that's important that's awesome because i mean i've known you for a few years here now right <laughs> and and um i can say that unequivocally if there's one thing that i had to have a theme where I stamped it on your forehead, it would be that. It would be yeah. keep progressing, keep expanding. And uh, and that's cool. And it's interesting to see the different roles that you've taken on in different projects over the years and, and that type of thing. And, and that's that's true. I think that you're yeah. playing it out um, 100%. So that's kind of cool to see. So very cool. All yeah, right. I remember a time. I remember a time. And we, we always worked with a business coach, not not a chiropractic business coach or a nutrition coach or anything like that. We worked with a business coach that used to be CEO of like huge companies, MBA, the whole thing, like strictly business. And, you know, she she had a lot of cool stuff that she taught us. But I remember her saying to me one time, like, 
Brent, so what are you, what are you doing? Like, what are you, what's your health regimen like? And I guess I was probably struggling a little bit. And, and again, not struggling like most people struggle, like, you know, uptown problems, you know, just trying to get to the next level. Mm -hmm. And I had to confess that I'm like, she's like, are you working out? And I'm like, no, I, I'm not working out. I'm too busy. And right. she looked at me like I had three heads. Like, what do you mean you're too busy to work out? You're in the health, health game. Right. And literally at that time, I wasn't working out. You know, and I grew up as an athlete and I like to be active. I like to look good. I like to feel good. But the business had kind of taken over my life. And finally, I got to a place where, you know, I hired a personal trainer. I made it a priority. I put my money in that space. I put my time. I scheduled it. And I think at the time I was like, and I was skinny. I was, and I wasn't feeling particularly good. I think I got down to like maybe 175, 180 pounds. And I'm the type, my metabolism works in such a way like, if I don't eat a lot and I don't lift weights, I get really skinny and I don't feel good. I don't look good, et cetera. And man, I put on like 20 pounds of muscle over the course of you know, several months, right? And I tell you what, man, my results in clinic and how many people I was able to attract and admit into practice and, and um, properly motivate right. to do their own transformation. Oh, I mean, it went through the roof. It was un the, the change was unbelievable. Hmm. Wow. So when you're coaching doctors or clinicians right now, how many of them would you say are actually participating in their health the way that they should be? From a percentage standpoint. Uh, yeah, not enough of them. Uh, <laughs> probably, you know, I'd say probably half. It's okay. probably like a fifth, you know, close to a 50 50 deal. Yeah. And I will tell you that almost to a person, the people who are participating in their personal health routines the right way. Yeah. Um, and, and again, not perfect. We're no one's perfect. You're going to make mistakes. Um, but taking steps, those are the guys who do well and gals. Yeah. Those are the folks who do well. I'll give you another very obvious example. Um, I'm thinking of a current doctor practices in California, been with us for many years. When he first started with us, um, you know, he, he hadn't been exposed to functional medicine. He was just a typical chiropractor, you know, the musculoskeletal, more right. traditional chiropractic services. And when he started to get exposed to functional medicine, he was overweight. He didn't feel particularly well, hudgy, you know, that so, sort of thing. But when he started learning about all this stuff, he was like, he, it lit him on fire. Like, this is the coolest stuff. I can't believe I, I never <laughs> yeah. knew about this stuff. You know, yeah, and he started implementing it. Lost a bunch of weight. We saw, you know, see him at some of the workshops. Like, wow, man, you look great. And he's like, I feel great. And his results went through the roof. But huh. then he fell off the wagon. And then I started seeing him at workshops. You could tell he's putting weight on again, not looking as good. And his results were down. And then we got him back on the wagon. And he's exercising again, eating well again, taking his supplements, running labs on himself, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then his results go up again. So oh, it's very, it's, it's been very obvious right. that this made your player. And just to clarify, when you say results, you're saying his business is mimicking his health. Yes, his business is mimicking his health. And because his business is mimicking his health, that impacts the end user, right. the end user, the patient. The end user is the community. Right. So if you have a purpose and a passion, if your stated purpose is, I just want to help people. And most clinicians, that's their stated yeah. purpose. So <laughs> however you want to say it, there's a bunch of different words yeah. you can use yeah. to describe that. But if that's your purpose, then there's certain things that you have to do in order to be attractive to people right. so that you can serve your purpose. You, you know, in the functional medicine space, it's it's very different than traditional healthcare or traditional medicine or farm you know pharmaceutical based medicine. Right. You know, you know, it's it, it's it's shocking, but when you go to a traditional provider that doesn't have this philosophy and understanding about health and life, it's shocking to see how unhealthy these practitioners are. Right. It's it, it is. You, yeah. Very so much. You can't be in that space. Yeah. And just to give it maybe a different word picture that's not so close to home for some people, um, like who's going to go to a financial advisor that's broke, right? 
Like, That's right. It's, it's just not going to happen. And even if they don't tell you that they're broke, you're going to know. There's going to be something up. You're going to feel it. Yeah. And um, and that I think that's super important to make sure that take a, an inventory of the rest of your life and figure out what's following you around. Like what in in the rest of your life, what is happening and what does that say about your health? What does it say about your regimen to take care of yourself? You know, what's interesting is it just, just hit me like a ton of bricks, you know, your, your podcast is called Nutrition Hero. Mm -hmm. This is what the marketplace, the patient population is looking for. They're looking for a hero. I call it leadership. Right. Another way to label that is they're looking for a hero. And just think about what heroes look like. What is the archetype of a hero? Right. 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 It's, it's just an interesting theme. And, you know, this is a Nutrition Hero podcast. and you know, I, I would assume to a certain degree, you talk about clinicals, you talk about um, mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. But we're talking a lot about other stuff right. that is, I think, equal or maybe even more important to the success of the clinicians, the, the clinician employing this clinical model out in their communities. Well, exactly. Because the, the theme of the podcast, by the way, is creating nutrition heroes. And the only reason that people are listening to this is because it's already in their heart, so to speak. It's already in there. We're just unpacking right. it. We're just identifying it and growing that. If anything, maybe it, you feel it as a kick in the tail. But the point is, is that it's in there. It just needs to come out yeah. so that you can better serve the world you're living in. And that's the part that I find a ton of value in talking with you and you spending time with us today is that you've already lived a very wide range of in a very wide range of spaces that a lot of our listeners are trying to get to. And so I find value in just being able to say, Oh yeah, here's what we did and here's how we got there. Um, and what's cool is it's not just following a book, so to speak. It's just not done by the book. It's more of a process. Uh, and right. that process, if we can call it that, is uh, it's intriguing. So very cool. All right. Um, when we look at the themes that we have as our podcast, one of the themes is NSL, Never Stop Learning. And what are some ways that you can talk about that uh, you basically live that out? And I know you do. We've talked, um, you know, in the past about this type of thing, but what are some ways that you never stop learning? What are ways that you make a commitment to that? Um, boy, you, you're talking about present time, yes? Current. Yeah, for instance, um, I know that you and Dr. Heather are both expert clinicians and you don't use it as an excuse to just hang your hat up and be like, I'm gonna go do something else now. You're continuing to chase that ideal, um, I know that for sure, uh, but like taking courses and continuing to develop yes. your skill set, um, what's it like on the other side, maybe not from a clinical perspective, but like books, any books you're reading right now that you would care to talk about? It's interesting. Um, I'm actually I'm actually at home uh, doing this podcast with you um, because my kids are out of school and I'm sitting in, 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 in our bedroom, which has a coffee bar, whatever it is. And it, we've turned the coffee bar kind of into a library. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting here surrounded by, I shoot, I don't know, maybe a thousand books. <laughs> I, I don't even know how many. Yeah. Um, so yes, books um, have been a, a huge part of that never stop learning theme. Um, as of late, podcasts, I mean, we're, we, we are both podcast freaks. Um, we live out in the burbs and our, our businesses and our kids go to school in the city. So, you know, that's probably an hour to an hour and a half of drive time in, right. a, in a day, just back and forth to work in school um, where we're listening to podcasts and there's a lot of great stuff out there. So that has been really, really helpful. Uh, certainly uh, still taking courses. Um, we're currently doing and involved with a um, uh, cardiovascular um, 
almost like a diplomate program with Dr. Mark Houston sure. through A4M, sort of a functional medicine approach to cardiovascular medicine and cardiovascular diseases and problems. So we're always doing something like that. Um, I think our kids kind of maybe get the brunt of that a little bit because, sure. you know, we're gone a, right. a lot a lot of weekends. We're traveling to, you know, a seminar or something like that so that we are staying sharp. Right. Right. So is there uh, a type of schedule that you hold to? One of the reasons I'm asking is making sure that all of those of us that are listening to this right now that are trying to move to the next level, it's it's mm-hmm. not usually something large, like one thing. It's usually a collection of small things that move people along. Yeah. And um, so from a scheduling perspective, how do you manage your schedule? Is there a tool you use? Do you have an intern? What does that look like? Boy, I, I, first of all, I'm terrible with technology. I, mean, you know, I, I'm just, you know, this, I am bad with technology. And I just don't have the, the mind for it. And I think maybe it was my age is kind of in the, a weird spot when tech was really starting to speed up and I just didn't get into it. Um, I can do some things. So I think for the most part, how I keep my schedule um, is usually um, on, on a just on a Google calendar. Yeah. Um, and I'm bad at that. I'm really bad at that. <laughs> um, but that's that's pretty much how I'll run my day. Sure. But I think I think my schedule um, when I'm working at full tilt and and my most productive, it's pretty regimented, especially in the morning. Yeah. Um, I found that when I can be in a routine of getting up early, um, that might be like four thirty five in the morning, and having that time for meditation practice and then getting my workout in and i find myself to be most creative in the early morning hours that's that's when the ideas come to me that's when i can write i'm doing a lot of writing right now writing several books simultaneously and and that's when things are really really clear and i can pop out um, a a lot of good content and work at that time uh, before everyone gets up Gotcha. Uh, I got a lot of the personal stuff. A lot of times I'll work on my businesses um, in the morning before the rat race of coaching calls, consulting calls, having to be in the clinic, having to be in the warehouse, meetings, emails, et cetera. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I think from the scheduling perspective, the other thing that's interesting about us is we never stop working. We, we right. really don't. And that has its pluses and its minuses. Sure. But the goal is so big, we we tend to push really hard. Um, uh, Heather was talking to me the other day about a podcast she listened to, and I can't remember who it was. It was some billionaire guy. And, you know, like a lot of people talk about wanting to have X, Y, Z results in their life, but they're not willing to do the work. And you know, right. we've heard that before. And I think that's largely true in this in today's world. If you want fantastic results, if you want a fantastic income, quality of life, impact in the world, it it's not a nine to five job anymore. It just isn't. There's too much competition. There's too much going on. It's got to be more than that. And and from a scheduling perspective, that's that tends to, to be how we run. I mean, we'll be in bed, maybe watching, you know, one of our TV series like that we keep up with, like Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones is on right now, right? Yep. So we'll watch that before bed, one hour of TV, and that's pretty much it for the day. And we'll go to sleep talking about business. Got to do this tomorrow. Got to do that. Or this happened. You know, what do you think about this? Um, that's kind of how our day works. So one of the things that I know you do very well at, and I just want to bring it up here, is um, you delegate quite a bit of stuff. You do churn out a lot of information and and product if you want to look at it that way on your own um but you guys do a really good job of delegating i know that because i currently contract for you to teach some courses for biogenetics so um can you touch on delegation a little bit and how important that is to progress for you well it's become a necessity for us It's, it's an interesting game and i play this game with myself when things need to be done my instinct is because I'm a doer 
and, I, and I'm a type of person, Heather's very much this way as well, where there's this mindset of I have to do it or it's not going to get done properly or the way that I want it to be done. And um, to a large extent, that's not true. Yes, like everyone else, we've had experiences where that is very true and you kind of <laughs> get burnt by that. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we've created a number of businesses and a number of things that have to get done over the years. And if we continue to be the people doing the things that need to be done, we would not be able to expand. Right. So it's sort of a, you know, it's sort of a forced function where if we, if our intention is to expand, we have to delegate because we would never be able to work on things that allow us to expand. So I play the game, I play the game and I'm probably more vigilant at it than Heather. And I kind of, <laughs> it's a source of, uh, uh, let's call them uh, light arguments from time to time when she will, <laughs> yeah. when things be done or she'll ask me to do things. Next thing you know, she's like, I asked you to do that. I'm like, I know I'm doing it, but someone else is doing it for me. <laughs> yeah. So I play that game of when I'm asked to do something or, or when something needs to be done. And it's not something, it's something that someone else can do. It's not something I should be spending my time on because I, I'm working on bigger projects. Sure. Um, that I'll 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 go out and I'll find the right person to do it. You know, we have a pretty good team. Um, there are times where I'll contract people out. I'm like, hey, you know, I don't I don't I love mowing my yard, right? I love it. <laughs> I was just gonna ask you about that. <laughs> Is that right? All right. I love. It. I mean, you know, somebody I don't know who asked me this um, just a couple of days ago. They, I can't remember, but they, they asked, where'd you get your work ethic from? And, you know, I, I didn't really want to spend the time answering it. It was just kind of an, an offhanded comment. And um, I said, well, probably my upbringing, probably my parents, in particular, my dad. And one of my jobs growing up, and I hated it. I hated it as a teenager because I, I grew up in southwest Louisiana. And you're mowing grass in the heat, man. It's like 95 and 100% humidity, and it's <laughs> oppressive. It's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fun at all and you know I, I just didn't have a work ethic and and I was young and he would come home and I'd do the yard and he would just tear me a new one I mean he'd walk me around the yard <laughs> and tell me how it wasn't done and he needed to be done better and eventually I got it I remember coming home one day and you know it was, I'm 43 years old it was back in the day I didn't have an edger I didn't have you right. know a very good weed eater that I could edge the yard the way I want it, right? right? So I took a flat shovel over the entire yard and I just went all all day long and I I edged with a flat shovel. I remember my dad coming home and he was he's like, hey, I want to talk to you about the yard. I'm like, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> what what else did I do wrong? Right. And he was like, that's the best I've ever seen our yard look. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, that was really cool. So now I really love, like I have that meticulous gene that I think I uh, stimulated at that time. So yeah. I love mowing my yard, but I don't do it. <laughs> I love washing a car. Yeah. I don't, you know, Heather would love cleaning the house and doing the laundry. We don't do those things because there are bigger and better things for us to be doing and spending our time on. Right. So not because you're not willing to, it's just because no. there's the pro like, because seriously, if you look at it with the other projects you guys are working on right now, if you don't spend time doing those larger things, who else is going to step up and do it? Yeah, no, no, don't get me wrong. I am yeah. not above it all. I mean, I came from nothing, blue collar family. We, I don't know how my parents did it. I always seemed to have everything I needed. Yep. Um, I, so it's not about that. Just as a matter of fact, just recently, you know, the, my, the guy uh, who does my yard, he was he was running behind. It was over July 4th. We had a July 4th party in our backyard. And I'm like, hey, I thought you were going to come do my yard. He's like, man, I'm running behind. And he's like, I won't be able to get there till Wednesday. And I think July 4th was on a Tuesday. Right, right. And I'm like, oh, God darn it. I'm going to have to get out there and do the yard. <laughs> I had the best time. Dude. I spent three hours in the yard. <laughs> and when I, we were done, Heather and I were driving off. We were going to run some errands. I'm like, look at that yard. That's how you do a yard right there. <laughs> I just, I just don't have the time, and I can't, I can't justify with, you know, with my stated purpose and my BHAG, me spending three hours on the yard when I could be spending three hours coaching a client, you know, 
coaching the doctors and, and the uh, support staff in my clinic, helping right. to grow the nutrition company, et cetera, et cetera. I just I can't do it. So one of the other themes that we have here, obviously, on Nutrition Hero podcast is Nutrition Hero. Is there a time that you can think of where you acted as the Nutrition Hero in somebody's life? Uh, a case, maybe, or a time that you saw a mechanism work out in a way where you almost couldn't believe it yourself. Anything that comes to mind? Wow. Um, well, let, let me start by saying this, and this might pull a, a specific instance out. Um, I will tell you that over the, I, I don't know how many, I know that at our height, we had over 5,000 active patients. I know that I still have a storage facility offsite full of patient files. I know all of the treat patients I've treated through the consulting of other doctors. So I think tens of thousands of cases easily right. um, that I've been exposed to where I've seen the power of this model, this functional medicine, clinical nutrition model. Um, when it's done properly, what I mean when it's done properly, I don't mean just from a clinical perspective, because most clinicians have a pretty good idea of what to do right. um, with a patient, what button buttons to push, what supplements to use, et cetera, et cetera, what diet a person should be on, what labs to run, et cetera. But it's how you set up your patients for success, you know, how you communicate with them, the expectations, the goals, the motivations, you know, the whole positioning of all of that is really what sets up a person to be able to get into care and be successful, be able to stay in care, uh, implement, right? Yeah. There's that word implementation again. And that, that also comes back for a patient, uh, comes back to their purpose, their motivation. Why are they really doing this? What's really going to be impacted that's important to them so that they can follow through. So because of that experience, I've seen so much amazing, jaw-dropping clinical success that used to surprised the hell out of me. Right. right. I, I remember a time in my clinic and it, it was not an unusual occurrence on a daily basis for me to walk by a patient that I sort of recognized, but didn't quite remember. I knew I knew, didn't know their name because there were so many, the pra practice was so big. Right. And they would say, you know, I really appreciate what you did for me. You really saved my life. And it was just, wow. And, and you have that type of experience, but ultimately that would continue to go on. It would be like, oh, all right, cool. That's awesome. <laughs> because it's just, you, we take it for granted right. that right. these clinical results happen and because they become the norm in, in, when you're doing good work. Right. Um, so there might be people that are listening to the podcast that are just maybe dipping their toe in the water of functional medicine and clinical nutrition. Is this right for me? Does it really work? I just talked to a prospective client that I'm evaluating a while back, just, I think last week, it was like, you know, I just want to know, does this really work? Is this, this clinical model, clinical approach really work? I'm like, no, man, I'm just wasting my time. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just doing it for, for no reason. And I'm like, yes, it worked like big time. You know, this is what we eat, sleep and breathe. And we do it for a reason. Uh, um, I, I, I think I can think of, this is one that always has stuck with me. And it was a, uh, a patient that Heather and I sort of ended up co-treating just, he just bounced between the both of us. Um, he was a diabetic and he came to us and he was so large that he wasn't able even to be weighed on the scale, the medical scale at the office. So he was, he was uh, a big man. And uh, he's probably taking, I think, 300 units of insulin per day, along with, I mean, a laundry list of other medications from anti-diabetic oral medications to high blood pressure, cholesterol, so, and, you know, so many other things. And his comment to us was, yeah, and he was skeptical, right? He was a skeptical guy. He wasn't right. sure this was right for him. His wife, they lived a ways away, and his wife saw a functional medicine chiropractor um, that did sort of what we did, but for some reason, she drove him all the way, like an hour away, to come and see us. He's like, well, my wife's kind of got me here, and I'm, I'm kind of open, but I'm a little, 
little skeptical about this functional medicine stuff. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. Why are you skeptical about the functional medicine approach? You're knee deep right. in the medical model and you're almost 400 pounds or whatever you are taking 300 units of insulin and his blood sugar is out of control. And that was the thing with this patient is that he, he, what he said to us was, yeah, they can't figure me out. Mm -hmm. They don't understand because generally the, the model is to get your blood sugar down, just take more and more insulin, you know, when you make it up to where he was. But the more insulin they gave him, the higher his blood sugar would go. Right. And it's and like they can't figure it out. I'm like, just, you know, I'm, I'm one of these medical mysteries, they say, and they don't understand it. And I'm like, as soon as he told me, I'm like, well, <laughs> I don't know for sure because I haven't run the test yet, but I'm pretty darn sure I know what's going on with you. And he looked at me like, okay, whatever. So I go on to explain to him, here's what's likely going on. We're going to run some tests to confirm this, but I think I know what's happening. Well, what I thought was happening was that he was making antibodies to insulin, right? He had an autoimmune, at least in part, an autoimmune mechanism to his inability to regulate his blood sugar and the more insulin he put in the more he the more antigen he put in right um and, and the more that drove his autoimmune mechanism the inflammatory pathways all that stuff and sure enough we ran the test and he was a mess i mean a train wreck but the insulin antibodies were through the roof and we were able to determine that he had it again he had many mechanisms in play but one of his primary mechanisms was this autoimmune response mechanism that we were able to isolate, right? And luck, luckily enough, we had we built a good relate a, a good enough relationship with the patient and with his prescribing doctor to explain the situation. And over the next few months, actually wean him off of the insulin and begin to remove the insulin. And that's really was one of the major kind of that fulcrum point that allowed this guy to begin to have clinical success. He eventually, I think, lost 150 pounds. <laughs> oh I'm serious. Relatively no exercise. Right. Because he was he was too big to exercise and too unhealthy. Right. Uh, he ended up, and I think he came in, again, 300 units of insulin, was taking maybe 9 to 12 different prescription medications, no exaggeration. Man. And at the end of it all, when he was discharged from his formal program, the only thing he was taking was half of his prescribed dose of metformin. That's wow. it. Wow. That's it. And, and and to your question, it's because we were able to isolate that particular mechanism, I think. Again, that right. was that full point that leveraged his physiology to begin to recover and repair itself. So that's really phenomenal because if you're going to walk somebody in, I, I mean, it probably took more than three months. Am I correct? <laughs> yeah. He... I'll, 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 let me finish the story with sure. him because, and I'll try to keep it short. He was in a six month treatment plan. Um, he had 22 points of contact with us over that six month period of time. And I think he, he stayed connected to us in a looser way after that active program for maybe another year to year and a half. Okay. After that, and he did amazingly well. One of his goals was, and he continued to lose weight, continued to feel great. He just wanted to walk. He was a veteran, and his veterans group they did this exercise walk, um, and he he couldn't even do that. So he was able to do that. And one of his stated goals is like, I just want to be able to take my grandkids to Disneyland and ride the rides with them because oh. he was too big to get into the rides, right? Oh now, my gosh! Well, yeah. Right. Right. That's a purpose. That'll tug on your heartstrings a little no bit. That's, that's, that's one of the things we were able to get him to connect with to keep him compliant. That was the carrot at the end of the road for him. And yeah, it, wasn't, ultimately so it wasn't about the diabetes at that point. It was about the grains. No, and, and, and as a tip to everyone listening, if you can make, I said earlier, if you can make it more than about yourself with whatever you're trying to achieve, you'll get out of your own way more times than not. And that's what we do with our patients to a large extent is we, we get them to make what they're trying to do more than just blood sugar regulation, blood sugar control, getting off a of medication, losing weight, whatever it might be. So what, why are you trying to do that? 
what's all, what ultimately are you living for? And when we're able to get that per, the person to answer that question, they will almost always go to something that's bigger than themselves. And that puts them in the right frame of mind in order to be able to say yes, not to us, but say yes to themselves. And that allows them to follow through. through. But anyway, he moved. He moved away. Uh-huh. So we lost touch with him to a large extent. And just recently, he's come back into our life. Really? Um, yeah, at the clinic. And we don't really see patients anymore, but he contacted Heather. And he again, he had been living out of the area for several years. And unfortunately, he developed cancer. He developed a lymphoma. Oh. And as we began talking to him, when he gained a lot of the weight back, his blood sugar was out of control again. He stopped doing all of the things that we taught him to do. And the, the, he, he, this is not something you do and you stop. This is something right. that you have to maintain for a lifetime. So yeah, certainly you might have to do things more, more rigidly in the beginning but you can't you fall off the wagon to the degree that he did and now he's back and heather's treating him again and, and advising him and he's already doing better he just needs that leadership right right he needed to, to tap back into his heroes huh. that and, so and, that is that that is huge what yeah. you just described there for anybody listening to this right now that Maybe you're on patient number one, or maybe you're on patient number 50 in your practice. And from a functional perspective, it is huge when you talk about motivation and connecting people. People ultimately don't care about diabetes. People ultimately don't care about their thyroid condition. People ultimately don't care about their gut issue. They care about what it keeps them from. And ultimately, if you're going to tell somebody that, (laughs) like for me, somebody that lives in the Midwest, if you're going to tell them you can't have corn, right? And that's what the entire economy is built on over here. Um, right. You're going to have to be able to communicate to them in different terms because they're not going to hear you when you communicate just directly like this. It's going to have to be about what it is they're looking for. So that is a huge nugget that you just laid there for everybody that I just appreciate that you dropped that. That's awesome. I agree with you. Can I refine that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Here's the, here's the paradox. They come in thinking or at least portraying that they want help with their blood sugar, weight loss, et cetera. That that's just, that's the surface layer stuff that they come in with. It's our job to connect them with what it really means to be human. You have to peel those superficial layers back and connect them to what it means to be human. Just and and look, if you think about your job and your the, what you get to do as a functional medicine practitioner, whatever your discipline, you get to impact people in a huge way. And and remember this story as I'm thinking about it. I didn't just impact him. Heather just didn't impact him. We impact his wife because now, you know, th- this guy was, I think his doctor told him, you should be dead by now. And I'm pretty sure that's what he told him. He told that to us. And I don't think that was too far from the truth. He was probably close. And he's gotten, I mean, this, uh, we probably met this guy 10 years ago, Brad. Yeah. Um, and he's still connected to us. But think about how we impacted his grandkids, mm. you know? His grandkids, his grandkids not only got a chance to um, know or see or he be around and see his grandkids, they actually got to be around him at an age where they could actually form a memory of him. Right. And he could actually take his grandkids, and he's done it several times to Disneyland, and ride the rides with them. That's where the juice is. Right. That's where the impact is, and and the trickle down. That's probably even you know, multiple layers deep, deeper than what I just said that I just don't know about. Right. That if, like, man, if you right now, if you're listening to this and you don't have the hair standing up on your arms, like there's something wrong with you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like that right there to be able to give that to a guy, give that back to him. But then also to be able to give that to his grandkids that you've never met. That is right. amazing. That's the never stop learning theme that you spoke about. And, and also the, you know, getting out of your own way, the implementation and taking steps to become a better clinician, a better person, a better husband, mother, 
uh, you know, father, what, mother, whatever the case may be, yeah. it's, it's connecting to something that's bigger. You know, it's not just about the clinicals. The clinicals should be a given. It's all the other stuff that people connect with. And if you can think about it in those terms of ultimately what you're impacting, that'll be a huge driving force for you to continue to move forward and never stop learning. Hmm. Hmm. Well, doctor, I really appreciate your time here today. And well, shoot, we're just even being able to just pour into the audience some of the things that you've taken over the years and developed, but not only that, all of the, the different scars that you've had over the years from the battles and, and all that type of thing, just being able to lay that out on the table, I appreciate that type of communication. So that's pretty phenomenal. Any last words or any last theme that you would like to leave with the Nutrition Hero audience? Well, I think, you know, what, based on what you just said, you know, find out what, again, find out what your purpose is. What is your passion? What is the thing you would do even if you weren't getting paid? What is the thing that you would do no matter how hard it got, no matter how much you were attacked, no matter um, what people said about you, what is that thing? Um, really focus on, on that because, again, from there, that's the springboard of the platform that you step off of to do everything else. So when we work in our businesses and in our life and we have business opportunities and things that we could do to make money, we don't just say, oh, oh well, shoot, we can make a lot of money doing that. No, what we first say is, does that help us change the face of healthcare? Does it fit into that value system? Does that purpose, that passion? And if the answer is yes, we give it some serious consideration. If the answer is no, we'll walk away, even if it might look like easy money, um, because that's at the end of the day, that's not what it's about. Um, so I think that's probably the, the what, what I would want to leave the audience with. Um, and, and, yeah. and the last thing I'll say, uh, first of all, that went by really quickly. I was having a lot of fun. <laughs> like, oh, you done already? I have so much more to say and so much more yeah. to give. Um, I felt like we just touched loosely on on, on multiple things, yeah. but um, I, I appreciate the fact that you're doing this. Um, I've watched your career at an intimate level for many years, and I've seen how you continue to stick with um, this functional medicine space and clinical nutrition space and continue to impact it uh, in, in various ways. So I appreciate you, you know, sort of producing, if you will, this nutrition hero podcast and allowing me to be on it today.